how do we think the future? We find ourselves living at the threshold of the 21st century, actually at the threshold of the third millennia. And though I believe there is no particular meaning to this time, I still think it's a coordinate that invites to think in terms of centuries and millennia. I know that I always do it, and when I look back to history, and I can look back to more than 2,000 years ago and look at the arising of philosophy as the first act of rebellion against ignorance and superstition. And I like to think that the first act of rebellion is an act of love, because philo, the, the meaning of it is love. It's the love of wisdom. So I can imagine for a moment that we are in the year 3000, and from there we look back to this junction, and we say, yes, this was the beginning of the third millennia, and it was an incredibly rich and powerful moment in which a brave civilization found a way to bridge unthinkable gaps, conceptual gaps, material gaps, and brought humanity into the beginning of its next era, thanks to its knowledge and technology and empathy and thought. And I may be in the year 3000 and say, well, we know there was an incredibly potential civilization somewhere in the beginning of the third millennia, but their disparity in the way the resources were used and the wealth were distributed, eventually, together with some climate disaster, brought everything into destruction and chaos, and all their data servers were destroyed in the process. So we basically know nothing about them. They had something. It was called the Internet, but we never got to see it. So how do we think the future? and how do we let the future think the now? There is a very big transformation that went on along history of how, as humans, we think the future. For many centuries, the future was basically a repository of ideal projections. It doesn't matter if it was utopia, or if it was prophecies, or if it was the triumph of good, of reason, of truth. It was a screen upon which we were projecting. And we need to come to the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th, where we finally begin to project evolving ideas, evolving scenarios more than fixed ideas. And this is basically happening with science fiction. And only in the middle of the 20th century, we begin to actually have the data to look into the future and extract something out of it to step our steps into the future. But even since there till today, there is quite a huge change in the way we think. But in the middle of the 20th century, finally, we begin to perceive the future as something that we can influence, that we are impacting, that it's not something that will just be. We are the one to build it. So to show the difference, we have here, this is 1965. It's the year that I was born, so it's not so far away. It's the New, York, uh, the New York World Fair, and this was the pavilion of General Motors. They did back then a very pioneer and ambitious project together with the Walt Disney production and many scientists to create a reconstruction of how the future will look 60 years ahead, 2025, which we are almost there. Now, there is something very interesting about it. Okay? As you see, the future is beautiful, clean, aesthetic, and full of highways. As uh, it was spoken before, this road, winding road, given that it's GM and it produces cars, it takes every day thousands of, pas of uh, passengers, of visitors, they sit, strap in their seat, and they are taken into a journey into the future. They are consumers of future and they will be future consumers. And as you see, the idea was that we are 
uh, already harvesting the sea, and we also have hotels there, and we have uh, vehicles on the moon, and we have commercial port in Antarctica, and cars. Only the cars still looks the same because the family is still the, the same unit, and the woman is still about kitchen. And I remember that when I grew up, I grew up in Europe, not in America, but there was in the background this kind of belief that while buying better houses, better vacuum cleaner, better cars, the world was becoming better. So it was an actual belief that was part of the society. So we landed eventually in a very different uh, historical junction. And we think of the future in a fashion which is not that linear anymore because the linearity of this event basically assumes that whoever is in power will continue to grow with this power and to bring the rest of humanity as an audience into this future. And we don't think of it in these terms anymore. So what can we say is on the verge of our future? It's a huge question, so I'm not going to answer, but I'm going to give a sketch and to describe some kind of landscape, and I will do it through three major factors. The first factor, it's a very positive one, it's a very, very optimistic one, is what I call the intersection in between the scientific knowledge and technology. And we heard already this morning quite a few interesting talk that belong to this area, sorry. So I wanted to list all the new scientific disciplines that emerged from the moment when I found myself in university in the choice junctions, and I realized that actually I cannot list them into a frame, into a slide, because there are too many. So first of all, to understand, in the last 20 years, so many new disciplines were emerging that we can't write them into a page. And we know most of them, though at least by the year. So it's uh, regenerative medicine, it's uh, bioengineering, it's bi bioinformatics, genetics, and it's everything that came up in neuroscience through neuroimaging and neurotechnology, neuroimplants, neuroengineering. We have food engineering, we have molecular uh, food, and we have all the area of bioethics and philosophy of AI, and I mean, it's a huge, huge growth and a very interesting one. And it brought us today to the place in which on one side we can um, take the journey to simulate a whole human brain with all of its neurons and all of its synapses to understand more about it, and this is what the Blue Brain Project is doing, a simulating a whole brain on a supercomputer. And on the other side, we managed to create a very a economic chips, which are pieces of paper that demand only one drop of blood, and they can diagnose the most critical uh, uh, illness that you will find in the famous developed, in development countries, not underdeveloped countries. Of, uh, they can uh, see the hepatitis and the malaria and AIDS just with one drop of blood. And as if it's not enough, when I was in the university, actually robots couldn't walk. This was the problem that was being solved, and today they are cool and play ping pong. So. <laughs> Now, this is only one factor. Then we have a second major factor, and this is a much more difficult one to describe and to try to map. I call it the intersection in between the human crisis and the edge of catastrophe. The human crisis, we are above six million people on this planet, and we are already using more of the resources than the planet can replenish. And if no other catastrophe will interfere before, by 2050, we will reach in between 9 and 10 billions. And according to the pr prediction, to the calculation ahead, we will need six planets to provide the resources that we need. 
Together with this, uh, in the studies of the last few years among the new disciplines that emerged, it's all the system of uh, science of systems, and we realized very clearly that our progress has an impact, it has a very clear price. And in the intersection of our progress and the price of it, and this kind of uh, situation, we know we might be on the, er on the verge of quite some crisis. So crisis of water, which we know, crisis of energy, of health, of soil that is wearing out very fast. And we are uh, probably also in crisis of education and politics because we see it more and more. It's very difficult to go with it. So this is the second major factor. And then we have a third factor, which is a very a now one. It's the increasing connectivity, the growth of connectivity. It started with traveling, with telecommunication, with television. But we all know that the revolution of it was the internet and the mobile phones. Today we have 1.8 connections, billion connections to the internet and 4.5 billion mobiles around the world everywhere. And this is changing. It's changing the, first of all, the structure and the uh, equation in between individuals and collectives. We grew up in a fashion in which in our society we live as individual among individuals and when it comes to something that has to deal with the consensus of the collective, we would go to an institution. It's government, it's law, it's army, it's police, it's uh, banks and the institution would mediate this interaction in between the individual and the collective. And today, through this growth of interconnectivity, we begin to see something completely different. There is the emergence of local solutions, collaborative solutions, that are of an emergent type, and they are actually beginning to solve locally uh, problems that on the, global, uh, amount, uh, on the global level cannot be solved or cannot be tackled directly only by institutions. And we see it in crowdfunding, we see it in uh, crowdsourcing, in microfinance, we see it in open source education, open source politics, we have citizens watch, we have sites that bring information about law to everybody. So I believe this is a very critical parameter and maybe the one that begins to open doors. So how do we think the future once again after all of this journey? The time is ticking on me. So in the 70s, Gregory Bateson asked a question to the directors to the board of directors of the university where he was teaching. He asked them, are we wise? Can we be wise? I think this question is not be answered yet, but I would like to add one more question to this, which is, what would it take to be wise? We have a very clear icon about what does it mean to be wise, and we know it. It's the wise old man harvesting the knowledge of the past. Allow me for a moment to challenge this icon. I believe wisdom is mostly about scope of perspective and, if at all, capacity, capacity for intelligent computation. And the more we grow and we learn that future is a collaborative, active event that we are influencing and impacting, and the more we have tools that only 30 years ago did not exist, maybe we can use future as a leverage for perspective, and we can use our collaboration as capacity for intelligence. So we may allow ourselves to imagine a relevant future. And while we are at it, future, it's not anymore a one trail strapped on the chair and going with the main storyteller, with the GM uh, journey into consuming future. It's a plurality of open-ended narrative that each one of us is telling right here, 
right now. So how do we think about the future? And how can we learn to think it today? Thank you.